we're in. Polly Downs, welcome to the lockdown sessions. Thank you. <laughs> good morning. How are you today? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? Yes, I'm good. I'm looking forward to, to this session. So, Polly, you're an executive coach. Mm -hmm. uh, you're working out of the UK and the US. Uh, and we've come together more recently because of the North American uh, client we're going to be working with. Um, and I thought it would be really great to get you in on one of these podcasts to kind of understand a little bit about what your perspective has been through lockdown as a coach, what you've seen and observed, and maybe we can kind of jam a little bit together on coaching topics uh, and see where it takes us. And I kind of want to I want to throw a question straight at you to kind of dive straight in, which is, as a mum and a coach, you've got such a wide perspective of different ages of people that you live with and observe and work with. What have you noticed about human behaviour, about the life around you during lockdown? Big I question. know, right? It's like I'd throw you straight in the deep end. Can you swim? <laughs> you didn't even mention dog owner when you've got one lying behind you. I know, right? And your dog's been poorly, so that's like, <laughs> <laughs> we'll come on dog? to dogs in a bit. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure the dog perspective has massively changed. And um, Mike, I'd say my biggest observation of human behaviour is our ability to adapt. Um, so, you know, we when you look at all the phases, there have been lots of phases of panic, acceptance, resistance, anger, you know, every, every kind of one of those, the loss curve kind of phases. And I just, I've been really surprised, particularly actually having three teenagers at their ability to adjust. And after the first couple of days of realising they had to stay in, they just kind of got on with it. Um, yeah, it's been interesting. I think I've been less, able to adjust the them really yeah just in terms of needing a bit of space and well I suppose as parents we've been doing a lot more haven't we because we've got children at home all the time um so that's been a big that has been a big change in my life and actually lots of clients as well I think that adjusting to working from home has been really really difficult and that's I suppose another observation around your environment around you that how what a huge impact that has and how that does I think there are people who live all around me I can look I'm looking out of my office window and I can see various gardens and there was a kind of about two weeks and a sudden realization that there were all these men's voices in the garden and there are lots of families here where the dads go to work and the mums get the, don't tend to you know, tend to be looking after the kids at least around school time but suddenly there were dads in the gardens during the day and I think it seems to be great for lots of families and then just for others unbearable <laughs> to all well, be together all day you know I, I think I was chatting to somebody the other day actually out of Singapore and his job is he's in sales so he's constantly traveling he's a regional director and he was saying the biggest adjustment wasn't for him. He loved being at home. He had a nine-year-old and a four-year-old. He was so excited to be around them. <laughs> His wife, on the other hand, has got used to living without him at home during yeah. the week because he travels Sunday night, comes back normally Thursday night. So they have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then he's off again to another part of Asia. <laughs> and he was saying... After a couple of weeks, she actually came into his office during the day and said, listen, Kenny, we need to find a way of making this work. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was coming out of, of, you know, the room at lunchtime and, and like, is, is lunch ready? And, and she was like, hello? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not how it works. If you want lunch, you go to the kitchen and you make it. For yourself, yeah. maybe even make it for the kids. Uh, I, that's so familiar. My friend, she normally works really, really long hours, and she's at home now. And she's like, "This is really shit because everybody, like, 
they all expect me to make lunch now as well as dinner and breakfast and, and normally I at least can go and get a sandwich at lunchtime and that's it and now you know, she's the one working full time nobody else is doing anything in the house and they're still saying mum what's for lunch <laughs> <laughs> no. um, you, you talk about that adjustment and, and especially with, with kids and I think kids are actually the younger the children the more adaptable and resilient they are and I think you make a, a, a strong point as well. So I know we're laughing, but for some people, this has been a horrific period. And with mental health and um, domestic abuse, uh, it must be horrific to be in an environment where, you know, you're talking about being able to look out of your window and see gardens. And yeah. I'm thinking about those families of five people, maybe um, uh, parents who aren't working or been laid off, living in a high rise tower block in London, for example, no balcony, no real windows to open, and they're stuck there with five kids. Yeah. That's just horrific. And I see why, you know, here we're not so compliant. But that adaptability that you talk about, when you're coaching, we coach people to be adaptable, don't we? The whole point of coaching is to help people adapt their life to make it their own do you see sort of what's happening in the last few months as an opportunity for us as coaches where coaching is actually going to become more important say in the corporate world because actually it's one way of really helping to develop people's adaptability yeah and i think there are lots of ways that lockdown's really shown that coaching is hugely effective and I think well-being is such a huge area so um, I think with now that the model's changing so much and people aren't necessarily going to be ever going back to office life I feel like there is a, a much more clear responsibility for businesses to look after their employees um, but if they're not keep brushing shoulders with them every day how do they do that there is a need to check in and I think Lots of leaders are quite uncomfortable with that sort of to have that emotional connection with people in their team. Um, so I think coaching is a great way to help them to adapt really their leadership style um, and people who aren't leaders as well. I think you will have seen it everywhere um, coaching programs on resilience through lockdown, and I slightly question the word resilience. I remember hearing a uh, an amazing Zen Buddhist monk coach who's called Claire Breeze and she said it's not resilience it's that we should be looking at it's endurance and I think never have those words been more true than lockdown like every week upon week we're still going we're still doing the same thing so it's not resilience to me means something about bouncing back yeah. and you know brushing yourself off and keeping on going it's not we're not bouncing back because we still haven't got to a point where we can. We're just going, keeping on going and keeping on going. There's real truth there, actually. I think that's a really interesting distinction. It's not about resilience. Because you don't know you're resilient until you have to be. Yeah. And it's normally when some a tragedy or a crisis or some kind of stressful situation occurs, trauma perhaps, when you are required to be resilient. Yeah, and sometimes you don't, well, often I think you don't even know you're resilient until you look back and you have right. been. So even in the moment, you're not really aware that you're being that resilient. I think it's often looking back thinking, wow, I managed, how did I get through how that did time? I do that? Right. But actually, seven months into a pandemic, nine months if you're in uh, Asia, um, endurance is a much more appropriate word. Uh, I've often felt that um, anybody running workshops, I include myself here, on mindfulness and well-being, and it, unless they are a Buddhist monk, I kind of feel as though we should just leave it to them because that they kind of get it so much more than us. <laughs> oh, I totally agree, but maybe we need kind of translators in the middle somewhere because it's quite an extreme, isn't it, to go to the complete monk view so there's somewhere in the middle but you know, I think that is where people hold the space but I think the thing is there are there have been so many um yeah everybody's saying you need to meditate to help you through this time and 
my mind I think has been the most sort of active and relentless ever so I can't meditate you and I could do before but now I just feel like it goes mad and I've um, been doing some it's called dream yoga with this guy oh, who like talks that. about that it's amazing and he talks about mindlessness <laughs> and he talks you through exercises that are literally just to kind of forget you've even got a mind um and sort of take it out of your head and dump it somewhere for a bit and it's so, for me that works so much better so it's the kind of your mind is obviously active as he's guiding you through these things but sure. It's not a sort of conscious, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to you know, control these thoughts. Because there's another thing, we are all a little bit out of control in so many ways, aren't we, through this phase? Well, we have no control. Yeah. I mean, for me, that's the bottom line. And so many people seek control. And when they don't have it, they get a little bit uncomfortable and at best... And at worst, they become nervous and insecure, and that's not a good mix. Yeah. We have no control. And, of course, we're not very compliant in the UK, so now people are saying, why should the government have so much control? But it's that lack of control, I think, that makes us have to be a little bit resilient because we have to be able, every time something happens we do have to bounce back. So I, I take the endurance piece. I love that word. I'm going to adopt it. But I also think that on a regular basis during this period, there have been moments when I've seen the need for resilience. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a, a, a 21 and a 20-year-old living in, in my house. And apart from the fact that uh, I observed how much they eat when they're at home, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've got three teams, so this yeah. must be empathic for you. Um, <laughs> apart from how much they eat, yeah. to watch them not be able to see their friends or to think they can and then to be told they can't um, or they, they want to go away together, you know, with a girlfriend, but actually they might have to quarantine or they won't be able to get back. And I think in those moments, they need that emotional resilience yeah. to be able to keep moving forward. But I like the concept of endurance because as someone who who does endurance running, that really resonates for me because that's not about going out for a half an hour jog. It's about going out for a three or four hour run. Mm. And that's about endurance. I don't need resilience. There may be a moment when I need to dig into my resilience because I feel exhausted and there's still eight miles to go and I need to kind of stop, pause, dig in and then keep moving forward. But actually the process of the four hours is endurance. Yeah. And then getting up tomorrow and doing the same thing again, that's not resilience, that, that's endurance. It almost feels as though resilience is momentary. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, resilience is your kind of, your moments during your long run, aren't they, where you think, I, I can't go on, and then you're like, I've got, you know, something's hurting, and then you think, okay, I can, I've done it, and you get through it. That feels like, the, they're kind of, it's almost like they're little bits of resilience, but actually the, the real power you need is the endurance. So I, I remember when you are saying that, so back in 2013, I was, I was doing an ultramarathon, and it was 100k. And um, that's 10 hours of running. And I got to this point where I was at the bottom of a hill. And I could hear the noises on the farm, which meant the finishing line was close. And I passed a marker before, and I'd read 97K. That's what I had logged in my head. And I got... I got to the bottom of this hill and I looked up this hill and I just, I remember stopping, going, really? Really? And it took all my energy to walk up the hill and I couldn't run. I mean, I, I literally <laughs> was, my hands were on my legs, dragging my legs up to the top of the hill. I got to the top of the hill. I couldn't believe what I saw. The farm was still miles away. Oh, man. It said 92 I'd read, I'd read 97. Um, 
So I had still another hour of running ahead of me. And I remember in that moment, I, I sunk to my knees for about 30 seconds and I thought, I'm not going to make my time. I was gutted. I was just gutted. I, thought, okay. I can't believe you're gutted you're not going to make your time but about just finishing it. Wouldn't that be enough? <laughs> no, no, I'm competitive with myself in these moments. Um, yeah, no, I was more upset about not making the time. <laughs> I, I know I'm going to finish that. That's a given. So, um, and in my head, I, I went, okay, so you're not going to make your time. That's, that's done now. All you can do is finish the race. So get up. And so in that moment, that's, that's resilience. That's that moment when every part of the body aches. I've got no more juice packs in my bag that can give me a, a physical boost, no oh. more complex carb solutions to drink, no more Jaffa cakes uh, to give me an extra boost. And as I'm retelling that story what it makes me think of is you know for organizations today they've been going for six months and we thought we'd be back by now but actually there's another few months ahead and I'm wondering from your perspective and I'd be interested in the US and UK line here uh, Polly how do we get people in a space where they can still keep delivering when their need i think for resilience now is people do want to go back but they can't they're, they're at the 92 mile mark and they thought they were at the 97 so there's still a long way to go how do you help people unpack the fact that we don't know how long there is left or we you know yeah. that uncertainty I was like to say that because, well, there isn't necessarily an end either, is there? There isn't, well, there must be a finish, but nobody knows where. And I think as you were talking about your, you know, when I was surprised that you were worried about your time and I was just thinking, what about isn't finishing it good enough? I think there's a big, big question wherever you are in the world about what does good enough look like for you? So, because when we're talking about control and things there are lots of incredibly successful people are perfectionists there's no perfectionists can't really achieve where they need to achieve in this environment so where you know when i'm talking to clients who have got perfectionist tendencies we talk a lot about what's good enough you know where could you stop and it's good enough rather than it being absolutely perfect. Right. And so I think there's a lot around just understanding your own motivations, your own needs, your own drivers and values. Um, because I'd have been happy just to know that I would be able to finish it. You needed to know you'd finished it in a good time. Um, I do long distance swimming and I've noticed from that I don't want to see the markers. I find them really they're always off-putting for me, even if it's like a mile to go. I don't, I don't even know if I can be asked to do the mile because I'm not very competitive at all. It's mine is just a kind of for me. It's almost just a a challenge, but I'm not very particularly competitive, so I don't really. I don't care that much if I win, and I think or not definitely not win. Finish. Yeah, yeah. Finish. But then it's more about oh, I don't want to let my kids then or. And that's my sort of, you know, something I probably should be working on a little bit. <laughs> I know, good coaches, if you need. <laughs> so, so it is understanding that about yourself, isn't it? Because suddenly I could go back to really enjoying long swims because I wasn't getting stressed out about these numbers being held up. So that, to me, is my way, is I can then just get into the rhythm of it and enjoy the sort of almost meditative quality of it and just keep going. Whereas for you, seeing those things and knowing your time is good is, is really sort of keeping you going. So I think it is, there's just so much about understanding how unique we all are and I, there isn't a one size fits all um but and this is the huge challenge for all businesses is working out what each individual needs and in a way it always it should always be that shouldn't it but it 
it isn't and it takes a lot of resources to get to that but I think to have a healthy workforce that really is what's needed now. I wonder if maybe where coaching really plays a part then listening to you is in helping actually to start with the psychological safety of people in maybe even venturing back into offices Mm -hmm. Um, and beyond that it's the individual sort of development that people need to get things done yeah I sense that the governments did such a good job in creating fear amongst the populations of the world that the psychological safety of people going back into the office or, or taking the underground, I mean, ultimately, people are frightened to breathe other people's air. I mean, yeah. that's, that's what we've got to. Yeah. And the other thing I think that it kind of comes into psychological safety is around identity and who are you now? So I don't know if you found this with any of your um, senior clients, but they are used you know if you're used to going into a boardroom and taking the really big position at the end and leading these meetings and suddenly you're on zoom from your bedroom or your you know the down the garage and your square on zoom is the same size as everybody else's and people can talk over you and you're not commanding that power Mm. but I think people are really struggling to adjust to that and I think people who are, are you know, more sort of introverted and less likely to talk out in a meeting are suffering even more because whereas they might sort of think, I'm not going to go up to his desk and ask him, but I'll go and ask him at the coffee machine. There are none of those things. You have to actually make an appointment if you want to talk to someone or send an email. So there are huge challenges in that. And where's my value now that I'm not talking up as much or having so much input? And then you know, who actually am I? Because people don't seem to need me in the same way. So I think there's so much around, um, you know, who we are, what we stand for, what we believe in, our value to the, in the workplace and out of the workplace as well. That's a really interesting connection between, you know, not having those ad hoc conversations when you're waiting for the, the, the lift to take yeah. you to the fourth floor. Uh, and actually the deeper rooted one of actually what's my what is my value now Mm -hmm. because no one's really acknowledging so we have lots of zoom calls and zoom meetings but they're all tactical yeah i don't suppose we see and i know from sessions and webinars that, that i'm running a lot of the people are talking about what they miss is people outside of their team that they're seeing their team all the time actually yeah. They're not seeing their friends from other departments where those relationships have, have been been built over time. But like you and I were talking offline before, and it's actually uh, the world may never go back to, to office. I've joked on some of these podcasts, actually, and, and um, I don't apologize for it. But, you know, I'd hate to be in real estate or commercial property because I think that's a pretty tough gig right now. Mm. Um, yeah. organizations are all looking at whether or not they need to have their offices mm-hmm. um, and, and so they become very expensive if they can only have six people spaced out in an office where they had 40 right. yeah. I spoke to a client the other day, an HR director who was going into the office to try and encourage people to say listen, it's safe, come back um, he was the only one in the whole office. Wow. And this is back to our individual needs, isn't it? Because some people really do need to get out of their house into a different environment and be surrounded by other people. That's where they get their energy from. And, and I'm sure those people are the ones who are really suffering. Other people really benefit from being in a quiet environment. And I think it's much more inclusive to give people the choice because if you have anything, you For example, if you have ADHD and you're sitting in an open plan office, the energy you use just on focus is so huge. Um, So the the choice, it feels like, I think there are things like this that in the long term could actually be a beneficial change that comes comes around because of COVID. But 
as we were saying earlier, there are lots of jobs where you don't have that choice, and you know you can't work in a supermarket from home, can you? Or, no. You know, lots you, of those things. When you were saying about ADHD, there it sounded as though you were talking uh, with knowledge there of of working with people with that. That must be a tough condition to live with during lockdown. Yeah. Well. Yes and no, maybe it depends, I think, how it ma- manifests itself because it's such a big uh, spectrum. Right. Um, but yes, if you're the kind of person where you've got a big a big H, the hyperactivity thing, then to be stuck, if, you know, if you're talking about being in a high-rise flat with no garden or even balcony and five people in there, you know... How that just sounds horrendous, doesn't it? But if you're if you've got the kind of focus ADHD where every noise is good, is kind of every noise and action going on around you is disturbing your ability to focus, then actually working from home might be much easier and calmer for you. So I know I did a um, a podcast with a, an old friend of mine who I've known since he was three. Um, and he's hydrocephalic and autistic uh, by diagnosis. And um, (laughs) he was brilliant because um, he's had to have COVID tests because he lives in a a residential care home. Um, He was describing them, describing how he's trying to keep his attention and focus from not being able to go to work or see his family or his girlfriend, you know, all these things that are important. but his attention is difficult to keep on, on focus, on point. Mm. Um, and even in my calls <clears throat> with him, once he is onto something, he stays on it. So we were meant to go to uh, Edinburgh for his birthday in May. We go away each year for his birthday. And this year he had chosen Edinburgh to go to and of course we were flying and the flights were cancelled and we couldn't go to Scotland so that's fine and I promise him when things ease we'll we'll find somewhere so anyway we've now come to the point where we can travel again at least UK wide so we've chosen Newcastle or or Northumberland to go to um, okay yeah in November and I'm from the northeast originally I was born up there so you know I've got roots up there so we're going up to, to the northeast. I find a, a really nice cottage, sent him some pictures. And ever since I sent him uh, the pictures, his focus doesn't leave it. So now every single conversation he's having with people in his home, with his family, with me, is all about going to this cottage. Um, <laughs> no pressure. Um, so he wants to know what time he should come here the night before. We're going in November, by the way. You know, uh, so what time should he come the night before? Um, will he be able to? Um, will the dog sleep in his room when he stays in my house? Um, are we taking the dog? Yes, we're taking the dog up. Um, will he be able to sleep in my room in in the cottage? Well, dogs aren't allowed in the bedrooms in the cottage, so I'm not sure about that. Um, Will we have dinner? And literally, you can't get his focus off it. So now he's driving everybody mad. (laughs) (laughs) But what it's made me realise is that it's having something to look forward to. And when I sort of reflect that back into the world that we're living in, I'm wondering if we've forgotten what it feels like to look forward to anything. You know, for me, the beauty of coaching is you help people unlock their path and and people are motivated and engaged and driven to achieve that. What do you observe when when it comes to this kind of mental attitude of not having stuff to look forward to? It's so mundane we're doing, you know, the same thing every day. I think... There's a thing around people have really adjusted there. I think generally, you know, in, these are the positive examples. People have really adjusted. So they look forward to their walk that they can have, you know, when we could only have one hour exercise a day. They'd look forward to that walk or they'd look forward to a phone call with a friend or um, 
I've really noticed a massive difference of everybody being really interested in and appreciative of nature um, and the weather. We, we've been so lucky in the UK, haven't we, with the weather? But you know, I think there is a kind of a sense of being grateful for the small things generally. And then I've had a few arguments with people where I'm just like, you know, I'm just sick to death of everybody being so bloody nice and like, <laughs> oh, no, it's fine really, it's fine really, because it's not, it's absolutely shit and it is, we're having a really bad time and there are, you know, there are times where it's okay, but there are times where it's just like, this is ridiculous and it's never ending and it feels very claustrophobic. I think I always describe it as a pendulum of sort of claustrophobia and agoraphobia where you're like, <laughs> like too much space, not enough space and it's like, oh, you know, it is, I think, and things change you know, all the time they change but still we don't know where we're heading to. I think when you were talking just then about there's something to look forward to, I also thought it's actually quite clever the way that he's, you know, he's planning to such tiny detail you know, what time is he going to get there and things like that, because this is allowing him to have some control, isn't it? And Absolutely. there's that sort of, he he's thinking about controlling the small things, and I think in this situation, that is what we have to do. It's like, um, I don't know if you ever do that exercise with your clients where you do a big circle and inside is what you can control and outside mm -hmm. is what you can't control. That We can't control what Trump's doing and we can't control the virus, but we can control our behaviours around it and we can control whether we do exercise, which is going to feel, make us feel better that day or, you know, all those kind of things. And that feels like that's what he's doing in a, you know, in a very clever... He's got... That's giving him something to look forward to and it's very tangible and it's going to happen. It is. Uh, it is a little bit exhausting to be on the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> on a daily basis they need um, to do their control you need to do your I cannot control from contacting me about the cottage I, I <laughs> feel really bad because sometimes you know I don't pick up when, when he calls I might be busy and we have this rule he's only allowed to call once so if I don't pick up it's because I'm busy and then he'll he'll call the next day and of course if I'm not busy I pick up we have a good chat and we're always on video uh, call as well we always do it on video so Rocky's up we always do it on uh, on video, and uh, and you're right. He, he it's his control mechanisms because actually his awareness of the world is different to to ours. It has a limiting factor with regards to his understanding of things. Um, example would be he's not considered how much it costs to get there or how long it will take in the car and who's going to be driving. So he says to me the other day on the phone, I was thinking um, when we go, because we're leaving at nine o'clock in the morning, I was thinking I could sleep in the car on the way up. <laughs> and I just said, you're tripping, right? I said, how selfish is that? I'm going to be driving 500 kilometres and you're going to be sleeping. Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 I won't sleep. That's, that's, of course I won't sleep. <laughs> so, <laughs> no concept of, of those things. And yes, I know when we're there, we'll have a brilliant time. And, and he's already doing research, right? So he's already sent me videos of Lindisfarne, Holy Island. He wants to go and visit that. He'd like to go and uh, drop into the Angel of the North on the way up and cross the Tyne Bridge. So he's already planning the route. And, and it's this, this looking forward, and I wonder whether, as coaches as well, if there's a reflection here back into the corporate world in maybe we could get people to think about how can we recreate those ad hoc conversations? What could it look like to have a Zoom cafe um, yeah. that stays open all day? And if you want to, come in. You come in at any time, sit down for 20 minutes and have a coffee with somebody who doesn't work in your department. Maybe we could be a little bit more creative. Yeah, that's a really good, I like that idea. I've been doing some support groups, so there's no agenda at all. It's just people, so they tend to be specific groups, like, for example, um, parents who are working from home 
who come to the support group of maybe six to eight people across the organization. So it's really, I like it because it's very different. You, you might get the CEO and the person, the security guard could all, could all come into these sessions and just talk. It's a really non-judgmental space to just have a moan if you want to or talk about successes or ways that you've got through it but it is literally just about well-being and supporting each other and having those um, relationships in other departments for no reason other than supporting each other. You do a lot of work with well-being and I know it, it's a hot topic with you. Um, what do you observe in generic levels of well-being because work-life balance means something completely different now that I'm at home all day. What are you seeing here and maybe even sort of with your contacts in the US? Is, is the shape of well-being changed? Does it concern? Is there a worry for us with regards well-being? I think there's a lot of worry for us because of this sense of lack of control, lack of purpose, lack of identity. Um, some people have managed to find a new identity and they're working from home, personal, connecting with their community. Um, the neighbourhoods are getting, lots of neighbourhoods are getting closer. Um, but I, you know, I think the fallout is going to be huge. There are so many people who live alone who feel hugely isolated, as we were talking about, so many you know, huge increases in domestic violence and um, you know, just just the capacity to do things. You know, if you're at home with three kids of, of primary school age and you're trying to hold down a full-time job um, and you're trying to do teach your kids from home or make sure they're looking at their Zoom call, which actually in America they seem to be doing a lot more Zoom teaching. Here it tends to be more worksheets and things yeah. that they're given. So they do need a little bit more. Either parents saying, sit and look at the screen, <laughs> or parents saying, you know, needing help. The kids needing a lot of help. I just don't understand how people do that and feed the kids and tidy the house and do the washing you know it's and i think if you're you're a single parent that's kind of obviously tough if you're in a couple and you've suddenly been thrown back together during the day um and you're both trying to hold down full-time jobs like the tension amongst you must be incredibly high and then the inability to escape so and now things are changing there's you know, like now they're going back to school, but how long are they going to stay at school? And so what do you do about childcare? Do you need childcare? Because are you going to go back to the office? You know, all these things, I think, just add to this overwhelm. And I think that's, at the moment, I'm still seeing the thing that clients are suffering from most is overwhelm. And that's, you know, the, um, the just lack of answers for the future, that total uncertainty that's, not really changing. Uh, my friend Alessandro did a podcast with me three months ago and he said, we're living in the I don't know world. <laughs> Everything is I don't know. And there's an argument that we have always, but we have fooled ourselves that we've had some certainty because there is, you know, there is the argument. I think, isn't it a real Buddhist belief that there is no certainty? So we could just be dead in two minutes. So... Right. Well, you uh, we can't do. really, yeah, we can't really live our life like that. Because I always think it would be great to live for the moment, but then what on earth would I do tomorrow when I've spent all my money and <laughs> not got out? Well, assuming that that's what you want to do in the moment. <laughs> um, but yes, because Buddhists believe and practice a kind of non-identification, so they don't align themselves to anything. You know, when you go to a, a move into a Buddhist monastery, you give up everything that you have. You have no physical possession. So you don't identify with anything. Your room is literally a straw mat. You don't have sheets. You don't make your bed. You've got your mat. And if you're on the outside of the, the, the monastery rooms and it's, you know, rainy season, <laughs> tough. Yeah, <laughs> you could get wet, and you know, in in that world, if you think about that world, and, and, and I've experienced it, um, 
by 7 p.m. in an evening, you're going to bed. You're getting up at four to go and collect arms for the poor and then distribute those around the local community. You might come back about half seven, eight o'clock and eat whatever's left you eat as breakfast with your fellow monks. The rest of the day is spent chanting. And by six o'clock, it's time for bed. So I've often thought, and, and I joked with a, um, I was on a monastery a couple of years ago, I spent some time in one in Thailand. And uh, I was joking, it was this young monk and he spoke beautiful English and we connected very nicely talking about football and things like that. And we were talking about mindfulness and being calm and balanced. And I said to him, you know, if I lived this life every day, I would be calm and balanced. Because there's nothing to worry about. Your biggest decision is, did you take enough bags out to collect all the food that you're going to be collecting in the street? And literally, people are waiting for the monks to walk through the streets in the morning at the markets to collect food because they get a blessing from the monks if they give food arms to the poor. So this whole process of collecting, um, and they go out with all the Westerners who want to stay, you know, in the monasteries for two days, five days, whatever it is. And, you know, we've got these bags and the monks give us the food and we put them in our little throat, shoulder bags. Uh, and then the guys who have given the food kneel down and they get a blessing. And every day, this is the ritual. So, you know, I was doing this for a couple of days and every day it was the same people giving food, getting their blessing. The monks, we go back, we distribute the food to, we go and take them to different monasteries so that people who are living rough or living on the streets or poor, they, they get their food. Then we go back, make up our food, and then we chant for most of the day. I, I mean, you, you can't get stressed, Polly, in that life. Mm. So being mindful and wellness and mental well fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. But as soon as you're living in the corporate world, <laughs> yeah. that control need that you talk about, I think, becomes really prevalent. And maybe this is an opportunity for us to give up the need for control. And, and in an ideal world, I completely agree with you, but I kind of feel it's so easy for us to say that, but the reality is if people have got three kids and they're living in that high-rise flat and they need to pay their bills, you know, I'm sure they can think of nothing nicer than escaping to a mat in a monastery. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but the reality is we're not there. So what what can we do in the middle? And I think that's where, as coaches, we can really support people with that because where can they declutter and where can they shed some responsibility and where are those responsibilities really relevant or can they get you know and useful or can they just get rid of them because. We can spend, you know how in the night you can wake up having these anxieties and then you wake up in the morning and uh, I can't believe I wasted an hour awake worrying about that. All I have to do is that. Yeah, but I think yeah. we can get to the stage where every day we live and breathe like that, especially now with the combination of the overwhelm and the uncertainty. So I think as coaches, we can help people to just, you know, we can help them take a kind of, an above ground view where they can look down and think actually I can get rid of that and that and that and already life feels a bit more simple. I like the way you frame things because in how you frame the endurance rather than resilience and even in the way you use overwhelm rather than stressed I think there's a, 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 a lovely lens that you're putting on it which is far more pragmatic and shows non-identification so we are suffering with an overwhelm or i could say oh my god i'm really stressed mm. and actually the latter is is much more me taking it all on whereas the feeling of overwhelm is actually do you know what it is it's overwhelming there's so much coming at us mm. also little by the way um I feel as though we kind of almost come full circle because we started talking about sort of, you know, the, the stresses of, of lockdown and, and what we observe. And then we come to this point where you're talking overwhelm. I'd love to know, I'll make, I promise I'll make it the last question. Um, 
I'd love to know when you look back over this period, what's your personal learnings been? And you can choose whether it's as a coach or as a mom or as a partner or as a, a businesswoman. But what's, what's your learnings been? Because we always ask as coaches, don't we? We ask people, what do they learn? Um, yeah. So I'm doing it to you. I'm throwing, I'm throwing your own question right at you. As a, okay, I'm going to give a really honest answer, which is probably not the... Um, <laughs> doesn't make the most business sense, but I'm going to anyway. Because I think honesty is about everything is so helpful um i did quite a few uh sort of webinar podcast things right at the, for the first 10 weeks and it was amazing the feedback i got about the um is the fact that i was happy to be vulnerable and honest that it wasn't all a bed of roses and actually it was hard work with three kids at home and things i think there's something about if people could just be really honest more then it would be so much more helpful um for everybody so and there's something around simplicity so i think when i look back i've had so many phases i don't know have you had that where kind of moments of being like thinking right i'm going to really achieve something today and generally i didn't so as i think i've stopped being so disappointed i've stopped i've had phases i must have stand up for about 15 different exercise apps and things and i didn't finish one um so there's been quite a lot about acceptance for me and actually it's been great for me as a coach because i just thought i did there were all these things that are so easy for me to to suggest to clients to try but until you find the one that really works for you it's you know it's really it's it's only helpful when you find that one but there's a, you can get so much out of the trying the doing it for three weeks and then giving up without any shame like why why do you not why is it not okay to stop joe wicks after three weeks if you're finding it stressful rather than enjoyable you know it, and so there's i think I think probably my greatest lesson is about being more kind to myself and accepting that I'm not superhuman. I don't need to run a, a huge global organization. I don't need to be the perfect mum. But actually just getting through a day, having done some work and fed my children and they're all in bed, pretty good achievement through this phase. That, that really resonates because... I got really annoyed at the beginning of lockdown when right across social media, I think it might have been J.K. Rowling who started it off actually, um, with everyone's got a book in them. Oh, yes. I did try and write a book as well. <laughs> don't, waste, <laughs> don't waste lockdown by not learning a language or musical instrument or writing your book. I learned I don't have a book in me. Uh, the thought of <laughs> writing a book is much greater in me than the desire to write one. Um, I didn't want to learn languages. Um, I didn't want to learn a musical instrument. Actually, I wanted to get through with my business intact and that was going to be enough. Yeah. Um, and actually what grew out of lockdown were these podcasts where I decided that all of the conversations I was having with my coaches or with clients was work-related and I wanted to try and recreate the ad hoc conversations. So this was serving my need to just have really nice chats with people that weren't really related to work task base but were linked to the kind of conversations I might have with people when I was standing in an elevator yeah. or sitting in a cafe. Um, and we're like 35 episodes in now and I just get to have really cool chats with people I admire and listen to their view and ramble on with my stories. Um, and I, what I love about what you just said there is it's about acceptance. It's about being kind and there is actually quite a an asian eastern philosophy about what you know how how you talk the, around the wellness around endurance around this idea of being kind and maybe just maybe b 
because the world has been through something at the same time, maybe we could even translate that to being kind uh, to each other uh, yeah. as we come out of this. Because yeah. I think you're right. I don't think we're very good at being kind to ourselves. Um, I even found myself saying it to a, a coachee the other day. It just pinged them a message after our session. And it just said, remember to be kind to yourself. They actually messaged me back with like emojis of, you know, a little tear dropping mm -hmm. down. So it clearly had touched them in instantly. Um, and I didn't respond to it. They can sit with that feeling. That's for them. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because you're right. Just because we sign up for something doesn't mean we have to finish it. Why do we beat ourselves up? Because I signed up for that Japanese course and I only did two lessons. Um, because the one thing I did was I, I actually played play the piano. And when I was a kid, teenager, I used to write songs. And some of them were okay and some of them were terrible. <laughs> um, and I thought it'd be really cool if I could find a software program that I could then, you know, play the songs and it would create the actual music. So I invested, you know, £69 in a software package, got the lead to connect to my laptop and my keyboard. Couldn't be bothered to work out how to use the program. It was too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so I gave up. Do you think you got £69 of pleasure out of just the ordering and it arriving? Because I think sometimes it is just feeling like you're doing something, even if you don't go on to do it. I actually got the pleasure, not just that, from telling a couple of people I was going to do it. And they never <laughs> remembered to ask me again. But the thought of doing it was worth the £69 on software. <laughs> but I now get little ping messages that my six months free trial or whatever it was is now up and now they've taken my money. Um, and so I've got a year from now and it's like, <laughs> um, that sounds like something to give. Is it your cousin who you're taking to England? Oh no! So that's my uh, my. He's uh, he was one of the first kids I uh, statemented when I worked with young people with special needs. So my first, okay. first job out of uni was working with uh, young people with autism. Oh, I remember you saying, yeah, yeah. So and he's he was the first kid that walked through my door, and. He made such an impact on me at yeah. three that we stayed in touch even after I left and we just became family friends. Oh, great. Um, and so is Tim, who I'm taking up to, to Northumberland. I think the software sounds like a great present for him, a great project. <laughs> Work out how to do this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Polly, will you come back in a couple of months and do another episode? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. It's been great to talk to you. That was brilliant fun. Thank you so much. And I think we'll we'll call this one uh, Learn to be kind to yourself. I think there's somewhere in the title we need to have that statement because that's what's really I've been left with after this conversation is that need to be kind and a little bit generous to ourselves. Great title. Love it. Polly Dowes, thank you so much, and we'll see you again very soon. Thanks, Dad. Bye. Bye.